This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the Pixel Review that puts me back in my happy place after a couple of years of the Pixels being, well, you know, kind of overpriced for what you got, upper mid-range CPUs, great cameras, but cameras that hadn't evolved in terms of the hardware in several years, all that sort of stuff. Well, you know, this is like the consumer fantasy. What if they lower the price while giving you much better specs? That's actually what's happened this time with this Pixel 6 and the Pixel 6 Pro. Now we have the big one, which is the Pixel 6 Pro, but uh, quite similar. And I'll talk about what the differences are between the two of them. So the Pixel 6 has a 6.4 inch full HD plus OLED 90 Hertz display. And it starts at $599, which is $100 less than the Pixel 5, which had all those misgivings of mid-ranging, non-evolved cameras, smaller display at six inches, that sort of thing. And then if you want to get even higher end and a bigger screen, 6.7 inches QHD plus and 120 hertz refresh rate, then you're looking at $899. And it competes with something like the iPhone 13 Pro Max and the Samsung Galaxy S21 Ultra, but for considerably less money. So this is starting to sound nice. We are going to look at it now. So in the United States, it's sold direct by Google Unlock. I'm sure other places will offer it as well. It works with any carrier. You can get a Verizon version or you can get with Google Fi service if that's available in your area. And Google actually came up with their own processor. So this doesn't happen every day, right? It's called the Google Tensor Processor, and they have the Titan security chip, chip that goes along with it. So uh, if you watch the Pixel event, Google, it seemed like they were show, throwing shade at Qualcomm, but talking to them, I realized, well, no, not really so much. They had no issues with the performance of Snapdragon or with its 5G radios or anything like that. But particularly, you know, Google's all into AI and machine learning, and they wanted to be able to do some of the fancier stuff they could do on desktops or on servers, but on a mobile phone. But obviously, given the thermal constraints of a phone and the battery life issues, that that wasn't easy. So they went for, spent the last four years purpose building something that could handle that stuff. And not just to say, hey, we did it and look, we have live translate now, which is pretty cool, you know, and nobody else can do it this good. But because it also is good for two other things, your privacy, because now everything is computed on the phone. So no more sending data to the server, having it parsed there and sent back. So for privacy considerations, that's wonderful. And also, for those of you who don't have a really robust internet connection wherever you go, that means that all the fancy intelligent features are still going to work even if you don't have an internet connection. While we're talking about the processor, I, you know, you might wonder, well, how is the performance? And people are into feeds and speeds and benchmarks and all that kind of thing. And I can tell you, using the phone, and this is not final release software yet, either had about a week before it officially launches, I, it's very fast, very fluid. Now, I mean, Google could achieve that with Pixel phones on upper mid-range Snapdragon processors, so that's not a surprise. But the speed here is good. Gaming performance on this is great. In terms of synthetic benchmarks like Geekbench 5, it sits a little bit below the Snapdragon 888 that you'll find on the S21 Ultra, for example, but not that far off. And the multi-core performance single core is almost identical. And it actually does better on some tests like 3D Mark and their wildlife test. So it's all good stuff there. I, I'm, who can complain? Phones do have 5G. This gets only slightly confusing because I, the Pixel 6 has sub-6 5G, but no millimeter wave, unless you get the Ryzen version, because Verizon requires having millimeter wave. Got that? Confusing. Uh, if you get the 6 Pro, it has sub-6 and it has millimeter wave 5G. I don't think people care that much about millimeter wave yet, especially outside the United States, because deployment's really not that broad, but hey, you can get insane speeds if you do happen to have that coverage. The displays are very good looking on these phones, OLED displays, again, fast refresh. And my only complaint, and you know, I do have a pre-release phone here, so hopefully Google will address this. It should be something that they can fix, but the ambient light sensor is too twitchy. I mean, it will just change at the slightest bit of ambient light changing and typically running the phone a bit too dark. You can go and manually adjust it up, but you do want auto brightness to work correctly because you'll get the brightest outdoor mode only on auto brightness, and that's typical of any smartphone. Speaking of which, it is easy enough to see outdoors, even in bright Texas sunlight, especially when the ambient light sensor is working correctly. At first I thought, well, that's not as bright as I would like. And then the ambient light sensor caught up and it looked good. 
So that's fine because especially with a phone that's very photography centric, you really want to be able to see it outdoors. In terms of design, I like this a lot. It's a little like Google does Mondrian, but the, the colors are playful, more so on the 6 versus the 6 Pro, though there is that kind of yellowy orangey option that you have for the Pro. You can see the colors on screen for the two lines of phones, but it's different looking. It's, how else to put it, designer looking and quality looking. Gorilla Glass Victus covered, and where pixels in the last couple of generations have looked kind of bland and not particularly expensive looking, these look like flagship phones, which is especially charming when you think about the prices, particularly for the Pixel 6 model coming in at $599 starting price. The phones have 128 gigs of storage for starting, and you can go up to 256 gigabytes on the Pixel 6 or 256 to 512 on the Pro model, and each storage increment, like most phones, is another $100. Since Google hates as micro SD cards, and hardly any phone has one anymore, you get the amount of storage you need, but these days, for a lot of people with cloud services being available and stuff, it, you don't really need that much. We have Wi-Fi 6E on board, Bluetooth 5.2, NFC, and IP68 dust and water resistance. And we have wireless charging, and we have fast wireless charging, though Google says that you should get their Pixel stand if you want the really fast wireless charging, which is 21 watts for Pixel 6 and 23 watts for the Pixel 6 Pro. And it supports 30 watt fast wired charging as well. All the premium flagshipy features, and like flagship phones today, there's no charger in the box. So you're going to have to roll your own, get a, either by Google's or use whatever USB chargers you have available, right up to 45 watt laptop chargers will work. A standard USB C power delivery. So the phone ships with Android 12. As ever, you can expect to be the first on the block to get the latest release of Android. And you get five years of security updates with the phone. They've extended it. And three years of major OS updates, which means you should be good all the way up to Android 15. So that's pretty nice, too. And some of the Pixel-specific software features using the AI, the tensor cores and stuff, are the live translate. So you can kind of like have a Star Trek-like universal transcriber experience there and speak with people in real time when neither of you speaks the same language, which is kind of neat. Or if you're watching a French movie that doesn't have subtitles, it should be able to actually transcribe it in something like real time so you can still sort of follow along. It's nice to have. Again, it's done on the phone for your privacy, so that's good too. Uh, it has anti-phishing and anti-malware software, again, processed on the phone. I asked Google the details about how that's done. They didn't say much, but they said it doesn't re require occasional software downloads to update that database. That's interesting. The separate security core is there. So even if you get, say, like a buffer overflow on the CPU and somebody is trying to get your data or your passwords or something, well, it's on a separate chip, sort of like Apple's doing too with their separate security chip and secure enclaves and all that sort of thing. So that's good to see. Um, also, for the camera, when I'll talk about that more in detail in a minute, but you've got some new AI features for the camera. Now, that's great that all this is being done on the phone for your privacy, but we're still stalking Google here. So you'll see things like if you reserve a car or something like that from Hertz and you get an email about it, it can automatically add that to your calendar, which means it's still reading your email. So, you know, it depends on how you feel about that's the way of the world today. So we're not completely free of privacy concerns on phones. And speaking of something like that, or say you did an airline reservation, it can automatically surface at convenient times or appropriate times, things like where you are and what time it is. So you're at the airport, it's an hour before your flight, and it's going to surface in the notification area your boarding pass to make life easier. So those kind of things are pretty nice, and that's when I'm like, okay, I'll give up a little of my privacy because that just makes life so much better. But again, I leave that up to you. Other things are you don't have to say, hey, you know who. <laughs> For certain commands, if a phone comes in, phone call comes in, you can just say answer and it uses the context of, well, the phone is ringing to figure out what you mean. If your alarm clock goes off, you can just say stop or any other probably selection of nasty things I usually say to tell it to stop, to stop it without having to use the, hey, you know what command. So let's talk about the cameras. Almost, other than the fact that you like 
guaranteed software updates and a clean pixel-like software experience, you're here for the cameras because pixels just do such a great job. Well, here's the first good news. Uh, you know how the video used to kind of suck eggs? Yeah, it's so much better now. I'm not sure it's, you know, the iPhone really is the, the bar. And I, I wouldn't say it's quite as good as the iPhone yet, but the fact that it's getting pretty close and you got to look at it and think about it means that's a lot of improvement. And versus the S21 Ultra as well, it's holding its own. So the camera's here, and one interesting thing is you don't have to just use the built-in Google camera app to get some of the features like HDR Plus, for example, because they're baked into the Tensor CPU now. So the image processing happens on chip. So if you're using Instagram or whatever third-party app to take a picture, you'll still get some of the enhancements that are available. Now we've got a 50 megapixel main sensor. So after being stuck with the same sensors, 12 megapixel and so on, that's a nice jump up. And we have a 48 megapixel telephoto camera only on the Pro. The standard six doesn't get the telephoto camera. The rest of the stuff stays the same in terms of the cameras. And we have a 12 megapixel ultra wide camera as well. And you can see the camera specs on screen. So the good news is more data, more pixels does make a difference. I mean, sometimes we have seen high megapixel phones that actually from other brands don't take super great photos. And in this case, they're using the pixels and the data really well here. Really, really good stuff. I mean, in night mode, of course, we expect night sight to be quite good. By the way, that's supported in third party apps too, because that's handled on the Tensor chip. But really good. Still night shots look a little brighter than, well, reality, but they're very colorful and they're very sharp. With the wide angle, ultra wide angle camera, you do have to hold the phone pretty still, I've noticed. And telephoto with all camera phones is the one that hurts the most for night mode. But if you stick with mostly the main or hold your ultra wide really still, beautiful. In terms of the images, what we expect from a pixel is that natural digital SLR kind of look to them, not over sharpened or over colorized, hello Samsung, you know, and not overly sharpened vegetation, which has been a problem for me with the iPhone 12, a little better with the iPhone 13 Pro, but still every blade of grass is a little too distinct. So pixels typically don't do that as much. And they're mostly sticking with that. Sometimes I see a little bit of what I would considered to be a little extra crispy. Maybe I would like it a little less sharp. Uh, the, the tree that you can see right now, I would say that those leaves look a little too sharpened. But overall, still quite natural looking. The colors are vibrant, but good. Skies are a little bluer than in reality, which is sort of a Samsung thing too, but not going quite as far with that. And something else that they've done, and really they were doing a good job of this for years, is working on different colored skin tones, so people of color, chocolatey and rich, dark and inky, you name it. They worked really hard in the last several years on fine tuning that so people of different colors would still look good and highlights on cheeks wouldn't blow out, um, dark tones wouldn't turn ashen and dead looking, that sort of thing. So also well done. I. <laughs> It's good stuff. It, does it beat the Samsung Galaxy S21 Ultra other than for skin tone processing where Samsung isn't mm, so great, particularly with people of color? Overall, other than that, I would say they're pretty neck and neck. If you're talking about telephoto, now you have 4X telephoto on the Pixel 6 Pro. It's a folding lens kind of design. And in fact, I've seen in video sometimes it seems like it's reframing if I'm zooming on the fly, which is a little weird. I don't know if something can be fixed with software, but obviously you get even higher optical zoom with the S21 Ultra. But I found that the pictures that the Pixel was taking, as long as you stick to anything up to 10x, look sometimes actually sharper and better than the S21 Ultra, which is quite an accomplishment. That grasshopper that you can see on screen right now, that was a 10x digital zoom, so it's pretty detailed and fairly natural looking. One thing I will complain about is lens flare. If you're shooting it all sort of into the sun, not like at the sun, but just into the sun, there is some lens flare. Now there are three major features that they've used the AI stuff in your Tensor chip for, for the camera. One of them is the magic eraser, which is sort of like content aware fill for those of you who use Photoshop. So you can select something on screen and it can get rid of photo bombers. It's a work in progress, folks. Remember when Photoshop first released that, it wasn't so great. Sometimes you'll select something and it'll wipe it out, but it'll leave after smudges and marks and all that sort of thing. So software updates obviously can help this. It's got a ways to go. If it's a small photobomber, it's gonna be much better than in a, if it's big or in a busy scene. 
Then there's artificial motion blur. So say someone is standing, standing in front of a, a subway car, right? And you want the subway car to look blurred, but the person to stay in focus. And that's kind of a nice party trick. It's okay. And lastly, there's facial sharpening for the case where sometimes, you know, somebody's moving a little bit and their face gets a little blurred. Well, if it senses that, it'll use multiple cameras to try to capture as much data as possible to give you a sharper face. So how about battery life? One of the things that Google was saying that they could get battery life better while doing all these fancy pants things and having high refresh displays and all that. And the phones do have high capacity batteries around 4,600 for the Pixel 6 and around 5,000 milliamp per hour for the Pixel 6 Pro. Battery life is pretty good. Now granted, I haven't taken a lot of photos and video and all that sort of thing. So I'm gonna be hitting the battery pretty hard. Uh, but still, I would say it's good. They do have some battery optimization features, again, allowed by the Tensor CPU that's supposed to help even more. And there is a super low power option if you need to go up to 48 hours. But uh, for the Pro, it's lasted me about a day on a charge without a problem. So for a big flagship phone with a big flagship phone size battery, that's pretty good. I haven't seen anything that has rocked my world and changed the way I use the phone in terms of how long the battery runs, but that's pretty good. So there you have it, the Pixel 6 Pro. <laughs> I like it a lot. I also like the Pixel 6. So it depends on which size you want, how much money you want to spend, whether you want the telephoto lens. Those are the big differences there and the max capacity. So they've finally done what everybody wants. Charge us less money and give us all the bells and whistles and high-end features and make it a very pretty, classy looking phone. Yay. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.